This next chapter is going to take a look at vectors and how vectors can help us in calculus and in other contexts. So the question we're going to do as we set up this new study of vectors is what exactly are they? What are vectors? And quite simply, a vector is a quantity with magnitude which is a fancy word for size and direction and an example of a vector we might represent a vector from a point out to another point with direction. That would be a vector. We might label it vector v. And what's interesting about vectors is they're not necessarily unique. Let's say we've got a vector u, and we use the little kind of vector-looking symbol above it to let us know that's a vector. Vector u goes from the origin to the point 3 comma 2. And vector v goes from negative 3, negative 1 to 0 comma 1. I want to notice really quick a bit of notation. I have this little arrow looking thing above the vector that I'm going to write to represent a vector. The textbook uses bold letters to represent vectors. It's really the same thing. It's just hard to type by handwriting a bold U and a bold V. So my notes are going to be slightly different than the textbook. But that line above means we're talking about a vector. So let's look at what these vectors look like. The first vector, it says, goes from the origin to the point 3, comma, 2. So the vector goes from the origin to the point 3, comma, 2. That's vector u. The second vector goes from negative 3, comma, 1 to 0, comma, 1. And you notice that both vectors are going the same direction. And both vectors are the same size because both vectors have the same magnitude and the same direction, we can say that those are equivalent vectors. They both represent the same vector, the same size and the same direction. Now, we need a good way to represent vectors. And one way we can represent vectors, it's what's called component form, which basically means it is the size and direction from the origin. And usually, we represent the vector with square brackets, the x-coordinate, and the y-coordinate from the origin. Now, vectors aren't always set up from the origin. So to find the component form, what we can do is we can subtract the terminal point minus the initial point. So for example, if we were asked to find the component form of a vector with initial point, of negative 3, negative 1, 
and terminal point of negative 2 comma 3, we could do that by finding the x component and the y component by subtracting the terminal point minus the initial point. So the terminal point for x starts at negative 2 minus the initial point of negative 3. So negative 2 minus the negative 3 is going to equal 1. The x component is 1. For the y component, we take the terminal point of 3, and we subtract the negative 1, and we end up with 4. And we take the x and y components together to represent our vector v as the x component comma the y component. And this is our component form of the vector. Again, I want to make sure I emphasize that we use pointed brackets when talking about a vector, pointed brackets. And that vector of 1, 4 tells us that if this vector was centered at the origin, it would go to the point 1, 4 with that same magnitude and direction. Speaking of magnitude, quite often we're going to be interested in how exactly we can find that magnitude. And the way we represent the magnitude of a vector is it looks like our double uh, absolute values. And if I think about a vector, If I want to know the total distance of that vector, the magnitude of the vector, we could look as it, at it as set up with an x component and a y component. And you can see the Pythagorean theorem could be used to find the size of that vector. x squared plus y squared equals the magnitude squared. Or if we take the square root of both sides, the magnitude is the square root of the x component squared plus the y component squared. And this gives us a nice little formula to find the magnitude of any vector. So for example, if I wanted to find the magnitude of a vector v, equal to negative 5 comma 4, we would say that the magnitude of the vector is equal to the square root of the x component squared, 5 squared is 25, plus the y component squared, 4 squared is 16. And 25 plus 16 is 41. And so the magnitude, the size of this vector, is the square root of 41. Let's try one more example. Let's find the magnitude of, let's do the vector w, is equal to 4 fifths comma 3 fifths. Well, the magnitude of vector w is the square root of the x component squared, which is 16 over 25, plus the y component squared, 9 over 25, which is the square root of 25 over 25, or the square root of 1, which is just 1. And this is actually kind of interesting to us. Whenever a vector has magnitude of 1, we call that a unit vector. A unit vector has magnitude of 1. 
In fact, there are some special unit vectors that we are particularly interested in. We call these the standard unit vectors. There are two standard unit vectors that we're going to talk about in this video, and there's a third one that we're going to talk about in the next video. The first vector is vector i, which has an x component of 1, and the other component is 0. The other one is j. j has an x component of 0 and a y component of 1. Basically, i is a horizontal vector with magnitude of 1, and j is a vertical vector of magnitude of 1. And what's important is the vectors i and j meet at a 90 degree angle. Because we have these two special vectors i and j that are universally accepted, we can write our vectors can be written as a linear combination of i and j vectors. Whatever i is multiplied by represents the x component, and whatever j is multiplied by represents the y component. So for example, we talked about this vector in an earlier example of negative 5 comma 4. This same vector could be expressed as standard unit vectors as negative 5 times the i vector, because negative 5 is the x component plus 4 times the j vector, which represents the y component. Another example would be the vector 2 comma negative 1. Because 2 is the x component, we could write that as 2i. And negative 1, being the y component, can be written as negative j. This even gives us a way to write vectors that have 0 for one of the components. Maybe 0, 3. There's 0 i components, but there are 3 j vectors combined together. Similarly, negative 2, 0 would just use the x component, so we have negative 2 i. So in this way, every vector could actually be represented in two different ways. It can be represented as standard unit vectors, or it can be represented as a component vector. As we go through this video, we're going to express the vectors in both ways, so we can get used to seeing them both ways. But make sure as you're working on the assignments and ultimately quizzes and tests, you take the time to be aware of what format the question's asking you to express the answer in. All right, now that we've taken the time to define vectors, let's see if we can do a little bit of work with vectors, working with vectors. It's really what we're going to do this entire chapter. But looking at some basic operations with vectors, one thing we can do with vectors is we can combine them together. We can combine vectors. Let's say vector v is equal to x1, y1, and vector w is equal to x2, y2. Two operations that are very common with vectors. One is called scalar multiplication. And this is the idea if k is just a number, and we wanted to multiply it times the vector v, what that really means is take vector v, which had an x component of x1, 
and multiply the x component by the k, and multiply the y component by the k. It kind of feels like we're distributing as we multiply by the scalar or multiply by the number k. Vectors can also be combined with other vectors, though, with what is called vector addition, where we end up with vector v plus vector w. And when we add vectors together, what that really means we want to do is add their components together, x1 plus x2 to get the new x component y1 plus y2 to get the new y component. And similarly, using the idea of an inverse, we could also do vector subtraction where we subtract the components. And so we end up with addition and subtraction of vectors and also a multiplication by a scalar. In future videos, we'll take a look at how we can multiply a vector times a vector. There's actually two different ways to do that depending on what we're looking for specifically. So for now, we'll stick with vector addition and scalar multiplication. So let's let the vector a be the vector 7, 1, and the vector b is going to have an initial point of 3, 2, and terminal point of negative 1, comma, negative 1. I'm going to pause here because before we get too far, before we can do any linear combinations of vectors with each other, we need to know what vector v actually is in component form. So we already know vector a is 7, comma, 1. To get vector b, we need to subtract the terminal point minus the initial point. So for the x component, negative 1 minus 3 is negative 4, comma, negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. So we have these two vectors. First problem we're going to attempt to solve is figure out what negative 2 times vector a is. This is scalar multiplication, because we're multiplying by a scalar or a constant. Negative 2 times vector a, which is 7, 1. And similar to distributing, we end up with the vector negative 14, negative 2. Or if you prefer an ij form, negative 14i minus 2j. Let's look at vector a plus vector b. Here we're adding two vectors together. Vector a is 7, 1 plus vector b is negative 4, negative 3. And for vector addition, we just add the individual components together. 7 minus 4 is 3. And 1 plus negative 3 is negative 2. And in component form, our sum is 3, negative 2. With ij, we have 3i minus 2j. Let's subtract the vectors, a minus b. Well, vector a is 7, 1 minus vector b, which is negative 4, negative 3. Subtracting component by component, 7 minus a negative 4 becomes 11. 1 minus a negative 3 becomes 4. And we have our component form of a minus b, which is equal to 11i plus 4j. I want to make sure. We always have that vector notation above i and j. One last one of these. 
let's find 3a minus 4b. To do this, we have 3 times the a vector. The a vector is 7 comma 1 minus 4 times the b vector, negative 4 comma negative 3. Well, when we do that operation initially, we have scalar multiplication, which gives us 21 comma 3 plus, I'm going to go ahead and take that negative in. Negative 4 times negative 4 is 16. Negative 4 times negative 3 is 12. And now we're ready to add these vectors together. 21 plus 16 is 37. 3 plus 12 is 15. And we have our component form solution, which is equal to 37i plus 15j. And in this way, you can see how we can do lots of different combinations of our a and b vectors. Another thing we can do with vectors is we can find a described vector using our trig properties. And to kind of set this up, we'll think about the fact that if I have a vector v, the x-coordinate off that vector Using trig, we're used to saying that x coordinate is the cosine of the theta angle that is formed. And the y coordinate is the sine of theta. But that comes off the unit circle. If the vector is not a unit vector, we need to multiply by the magnitude of the vector. So we have the magnitude of the vector times cosine gives the x component. And the magnitude of the ve vector times sine gives the y component. And in this way, we can now find the vector with magnitude 10 that forms a 120 degree angle. Because the x component is the magnitude of 10 times the cosine of the angle. And the y component is the magnitude of 10 times the sine of the angle magnitude of 10, sorry. Well, we need to know what the sine and cosine of 120 is. So if we draw our little unit circle on here, 120 degree angle is right up here. It's the same as 2 pi over 3. So the x coordinate is negative. 1 half, and the y coordinates root 3 over 2. So 10 cosine of 120 would be 10 times the x coordinate of negative 1 half. Our x component's negative 5. For the y coordinate, the sine of 120 is the y coordinate of root 3 over 2, which gives us 5 root 3. And so for our final vector that has a magnitude of 10 and is going to form a 120 degree angle, it's going to be negative 5 comma 5 root 3, or negative 5i plus 5 root 3j. Let's try one more and do this next one in radians instead of degrees. Let's find a vector with magnitude 4 forming a 
7 pi over 4 angle. If I think about my unit circle, 7 pi over 4 is down here with coordinates root 2 over 2 comma negative root 2 over 2. So when we want the x component, it's the magnitude of 4 times the cosine of 7 pi over 4, which is 4 times cosine the x-coordinate, root 2 over 2, or 2 root 2. To get the y component, exactly the same. We're just going to take the sine instead of 7 pi over 4, which is 4 times negative root 2 over 2, which gives us negative 2 root 2. And so our vector with magnitude of 4 that forms a 7 pi over 4 angle is 2 root 2 comma negative 2 root 2 in component form. Or in terms of i and j, it's going to be 2 root 2i minus 2 root 2j. So trig can be very helpful as we work with vectors. We're going to do quite a bit of trig as we do different angles with vectors throughout this course. But I want to do one other thing with vectors as we finish out our introduction to vectors. And that is looking at this concept of finding unit vectors in the same direction. And the trick here to get a unit vector is we're going to use a scalar multiplication Basically, we want to divide the vector down so it just has a magnitude of 1. So if its magnitude is currently 8, we need to divide by 8. If its magnitude is 12, we need to divide by 12. We're going to take 1 over the magnitude of the vector times the vector to give us a unit vector in the same direction. So for example, let's say we've got the vector v is equal to 9 comma 2. And we want to find a unit vector in the same direction. Well, first, we need to know the magnitude of the vector so we know how much we have to shrink it by. The magnitude is the square root of the x component plus the y component squared each. So here we end up with the square root of 85 as the magnitude, which means we can take 1 over the square root of 85 times the vector which will keep the vector going in the same direction, but it'll shrink its magnitude down so it's a unit vector. This gives us our new vector of 9 over the square root of 85, comma 2 over the square root of 85. Or if you prefer 9 over the square root of 85i plus 2 over the square root of 85j. That is a unit vector in the same direction as the original vector 9, 2 by multiplying by the reciprocal of the magnitude. One nice thing about knowing the unit vector is it makes it very easy to get a vector of any size in the same direction. To get a vector. of magnitude k, in the same direction,
we not only take 1 over the magnitude of the vector times the vector, but we're also going to multiply by our desired magnitude of k. So for example, if we want a vector, let's stick with 9, 2. We're going to find a vector in the same direction. But instead of a unit vector, we want it to be of magnitude 5. Well, we already found out in the previous example that the magnitude of the vector is equal to the square root of 85. We want to get a magnitude of 5. So we're not only going to divide by the square root of 85, but we're also going to multiply by 5. And we use that as our scalar times the vector 9, 2. And that gives us 45 over the square root of 85 for the x component, comma 10 over the square root of 85 for the y component. Or in terms of i and j, 45 over root 85i plus 10 over root 85j. And that now is a vector of the same direction, but now with magnitude 5. We haven't really done any calculus yet. We've just been kind of exploring with this concept of a vector using scalar multiplication, uh, vector addition, ikj vectors, calculating the magnitude of a vector. So it's been a really brief overview of vectors in the plane, two-dimensional vectors. But it's really important we're comfortable with these before we get to too many complex topics that these are built on. So I want you to spend a day practicing with these vectors on the homework assignment. We'll talk about them more in class and answer any questions that you may have.